calendar because it's going to be a great service. You're not going to want to miss it. This morning, we're picking back up in our study of the book of Acts. If you're new to our church, uh, it would be helpful for you to know we practice a form of preaching called expository preaching, which basically means we believe the Bible is uh, best taught taking books of the Bible, breaking them down chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Our goal is to understand what God's Word means in our lives today. And so we're currently doing that through the book of Acts. And Acts is a New Testament book. It's written for a couple reasons. First, it gives us um, an understanding of how the church started. I mean, how, how did we get to this point? What what was, the, what was the catalyst that started all this? The second is it gives us a template for how Jesus intended the church to accomplish the mission of taking the gospel to the rest of the world. So we're learning a lot about that through this study. If you haven't been with us, you can go online to mcf.life. You can listen to messages that lead, it up, lead up to today. You may recall last week we moved into chapter 8. It's a transitional chapter. It's transitional because it's at this point that the early church begins to face the first round of persecution. Unfortunately, it took place through the death of a Christian, a man named Stephen, who was stoned to death because of his faith in Jesus. And as a result of that, it was a catalyst for a great pers persecution that began to take place in the church. We read about it in verse 1. It says, On that day, a great persecution against the church began in Jerusalem. So a good question might be, who was persecuting them and what was so great about this persecution? And great in the sense that it wasn't good. Well, we've learned that really it was a group of religious leaders that started it, Sadducees. They, they didn't like the gospel. They didn't like what the church was teaching. But it, it really came down to one individual that really pushed the envelope on the persecution. His name was Saul. We read about him in verse 3. It says, Saul was ravaging the church. So here we have this man named Saul. We're going to learn more about him in the weeks to come. But he's ravaging the church, and the word for ravage here comes from the Greek word that means to tear apart or destroy or to do great harm to. It's the same word used to describe a lion as it tears the meat off the bone of its prey. Not a very, you know, exciting imagery, is it? And so that's what Paul is doing. He's trying to tear the, per the church apart. He's literally going from home to home. It says, and entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. So, I mean, he's going into their homes, he's searching out Christians, and he's dragging them to prison. Be very similar to what happened in World War II as the Nazis, you know, sought out Jews, and they went from house to house, and they looked for Jewish people, and then they would take them to concentration camps. I mean, this is the level of persecution that's going on in the early church. The good news, though, is, is not everybody goes to prison. Some are able to escape and are scattered throughout the regions. Luke says, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So Luke says, as, as Saul ravages the church, the church members are scattered throughout the region. Now, next question, why is this happening? Well, we've learned last week, believe it or not, that God has allowed it to happen. Which might surprise some of us, because we'd be like, why would God allow this to happen? Well, simply put, the, the church had grown comfortable, and as a result, they'd lost sight of the mission. See, what we learn in Acts chapter 1 is Jesus has a mission for the church. He says this, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The problem, though, is, is that the, the disciples haven't followed that, that line of instruction. Yes, they've, they've taken the gospel to Jerusalem, but they stopped there. And they've gotten comfortable. And at, at this point, they're not taking it to Judea. They're not taking it to Samaria. They're just kind of sitting back in first century church, enjoying church life. In fact, listen to what Luke tells us about church life in Acts 4. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. No one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own. They had everything in common. There was not a needy person among them. For as many were as owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and they laid it at the apostles' feet and it was distributed to each as any had need. You see, why would you leave a church like that? I mean, that, that, this, is, this is wonderful, right? I mean, they're comfortable. They love the lifestyle. They love the fellowship. Everybody's needs are being met. I mean, why would you leave a place like that? Life is good at first century church. Please hear me. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with being comfortable. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with fellowship. We need fellowship in our lives. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with your needs being met. Hey, we all have needs that need to be met. But the fact of the matter is Jesus didn't come so the, the church could just sit around, talk, listen to great worship, drink coffee together, and sing kubaya. 
Jesus came to build a church that would reach a lost and dying world. He came to build a church that would be willing to leave the comfort of a lifestyle and go out into Judea and Samaria and to the rest of the world. That's the kind of church he's building. And the early church has lost sight of this. They've gotten comfortable, and now God wakes them back up to the mission as he brings an uncomfortable circumstance in their life through the means of a man named Saul. The fact of the matter is, sometimes God still does that to us, doesn't he? Sometimes God shakes our world a little bit. He turns it upside down as a reminder, listen, I've got a plan for you. I, I, you can't just sit around and be comfortable. Listen, you've got to learn to depend on me. You've got to learn to trust me. I have a purpose for you. So he allows a little discomfort to come into our lives to get us back on track. Now, you might be thinking, I don't know, Pastor. I don't know if, I don't know if God will do that. Well, he does. He did. Luke confirms it says that he scattered, they were scattered throughout the region. The word for scattered there means that they were thrown out like seed into a field. We, we also learn as they were scattered like seed into the field, that as they were scattered, he says they went about preaching the word. And so as a result of the persecution, as they're scattered as seed into the other areas, Judea and Samaria, they begin to do what Jesus originally asked them to do. They start preaching the word. It worked. And now today as we come back to our study, Luke is going to show us how those who were scattered, scattered the seed. In other words, how they shared the gospel. And to do that, Luke is going to introduce us to an individual. His name is Philip. We're going to talk more about him in a second. And we're going to, he's going to introduce us to Philip because Philip escaped the persecution of Jerusalem and he went out into the region of Samaria. But before we get to Luke's example and to what Philip did, I want to I take a few moments and kind of set up where we're going, not only today, but next week, as we ask ourselves a question about our faith. And the question is simply this. When it comes to your faith, when it comes to you calling yourself a follower of Christ, let me ask you this. Are you a witness for Christ? Are you a witness for Jesus? In other words, as a Christian, do you lead other people to Jesus? I ask you this question because your answer to that will really reveal much about what you believe about Jesus or believe about your faith or your Christianity. For example, if your answer is no, I'm not really into that pastor, I don't really think it's my job to lead people to Jesus, isn't that your job? Then I would say there's a significant problem with your understanding of your faith for a few reasons. First, to say you don't lead people to Jesus is saying you don't care about what's important to God. Because leading people to Jesus was so important to God that he sent Jesus from heaven literally to introduce us to him. Listen to what Jesus says. He says, I have, come, I, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will. In other words, this wasn't my idea, but the will of him who sent me. So if introducing people to Jesus is that important to God, shouldn't it be important to us? Secondly, if you're not into leading people to Jesus, it might suggest that you've never truly met him. Now when I say that, some of you will be like, Pastor, I can't believe you just said that. I mean, are you suggesting that I'm not a Christian? I don't know. That's not for me to determine. Guess what? That's not my job. That's God's job. What I'm suggesting, though, is that if you put your faith in Jesus, that should have produced a supernatural change in you that gives you a new love and purpose for your life, a love that should cause you to want to share the good news of what Jesus did in your life with others. The Apostle John puts it like this. He says, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. John says, listen, you can't say you love God and hate your brother. And when we, talk, when we say brother here, we're talking about a fellow human being. Now, you might say, okay, pastor, I, listen, you're, what you're saying then is if I don't tell somebody about Jesus, are you saying that I hate them? Well, I'm saying you don't love them. Because if you loved them, you would tell them about Jesus. If you really cared about them, you would tell them about how important it is that they have a relationship with them. If you love them, you would want them to know and experience the transformational work of Jesus in their life as well. But if you have no love for people, and you have no love for lost people, and you really don't care about what happens to them in eternity, how can you say you love God? Because God loves them. 
loves them so much that he sent his son for them. All that to say, if, if leading people to Jesus isn't a priority you, to you, then it should, it should cause you to stop and ask yourself, listen, is, is there something going on here? If I not truly experienced the work of Jesus in my own life, or do I not fully understand what I should be doing as a Christ follower? The third problem is this, with not wanting to share your faith. Being a witness for Jesus is something he's asked us to do. Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. In other words, you will be the ones who take the message of hope to others. You are the witnesses. What that means is, if you don't care or aren't willing to tell other people about Jesus, you are walking in no disobedience to Jesus. All that to say, if to, to, to say you're a Christian but not lead people to Jesus, not make that a priority, means there's some kind of disconnect for you in your faith because if you fully understood it, if you fully experienced it, you'd want to share it with others. Just something to think about. However, if you answer, yes, pastor, I want to be a witness. I know I need to be a witness. It might not be the best witness, but I understand I need to do this and I want to do this. Well, that's a good indicator. You experience the work of God in your life and you understand the importance of sharing your faith. Now, here's why I ask you to consider this question, because what we all need to understand is putting our faith in Jesus isn't just about us escaping hell. I hope you know that. That's part of it. Salvation is part of it. The other part of it is you becoming a witness. You now becoming one that testifies to who Jesus is and what he's done in your life as you share your faith with others. So to help us kind of understand what that all means and what that looks like, for the next two weeks and through this man named Philip, we're going to learn what being a witness looks like and what that means for us. And my hope is by the time we get through chapter 8 and really to the end of this month, that you and I will not only have a better understanding of what it means to be a witness, but that we will be supernaturally equipped to be the witnesses that Jesus wants us to be, and that through our witness, we will see a great harvest of souls, not only in Marysville, but in the surrounding regions that we live in. Y'all with me? So to get us started, let's pick up in, in chapter 8 as Luke introduces us to a Christian witness. A man named Philip, beginning in verse 4. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. Last week we learned as the persecution took place, the church was scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. To put that in our context, that would be like, you know, the gospel going out from Marysville Christian Fellowship to places like Blue Rapids and Waterville and Frankfurt and Home City and Beatty and Wymore and Beatrice and Washington and Seneca and all the other communities that we seem to touch at times. Those are our Judeas and Samarias. We also learned that as they were scattered, they began to share their faith. They began to preach the word. And what that tells us is while the persecution was no fun, it served its purpose. Instead of sitting around, you know, complaining about what was happening and, and getting upset, they just continued to share the gospel. And probably a good lesson for you and I because, you know, in our country as persecution comes, what we tend to do is we, we tend to get upset. We, we tend to say, well, what about my rights? what the early Christians, they didn't, they didn't say, what about my rights? They just started telling more people about Jesus. That's how they responded to persecution. Maybe there's a lesson in that for us as well. But we're going to focus on today is how they shared it. And so with our time this morning, I want to walk through this passage, and I want to uncover how Philip shared the gospel. What was his strategy? How did he scatter the seed? What I want to suggest to you is there are three principles here this morning that if you and I will grasp onto these principles, I believe we will be able to scatter the seed of the gospel in a greater way in our community. And I believe God will work supernaturally through that. Here's the first principle we see through Philip's witness. In order to be a witness, we have to be committed to loving all people. Loving all people. Luke says, those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip 
went down to the city of Samaria. A couple things about this passage I want to show you. Number one, we are now officially introduced to Philip. Who is this man? Well, if you remember, we first met Philip back in chapter 6. As the church grew, they faced some challenges. There were people whose needs were being met, a group of widows. They were being overlooked, marginalized. And so a group of men were selected to minister to the needs of these widows. One of these men is a man named Stephen. Another man, his name is Philip. Back in Luke 6, we read this, And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip. So who is Philip? Well, Philip is a, obviously a servant. He's a servant in the early church. He has a heart to serve people. He, he specifically wants to help people who have been marginalized and neglected. Not only do we see that back in chapter 6, we now see it in chapter 8, because Luke says after being forced out of Jerusalem, Luke says that Philip went straight to Samaria. So a good question might be, why is that significant? What's the big deal about him going to Samaria? Well, it's significant because Samaria is full of people known as Samaritans. And in the first century, Samaritans and Jewish people didn't get along. Best way I can describe it is if you have a room full of Bronco fans and Chiefs fans. It just doesn't work very well, right? They just don't mix together. So the Samaritans and the Jews, they didn't mix well together. In fact, they hated one another. So why did they hate each other? Well, just let me just give you a little history. And this just paints a small picture of the hatred. But here's a little history on the Samaritan. The Samaritans were actually descendants of the Jewish people. See, back in 722 B.C., something happened, though, to the northern tribes of Israel that forever changed their genealogy. In 722, the Assyrians invaded Israel, and they took a large number of Israelites captive back to Assyria. However, they didn't take all of the Israelites. They left some of them there. Israelites that they, they viewed as the weakest of society. Because in ancient times, when a country invaded another country, what they would do is they would harvest the sharpest and the brightest from that country, and then they'd transport them back to their homeland to put them to use there. So in a way, they, they treated captured people like commodities that they could better use to, 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 to uplift their own nation. So, for example, if somebody were to invade, you know, the United States and they took our best teachers and scientists and farmers and businessmen and, and our best sports teams like the Broncos and they transported them out of the United States and into another country, leaving us with, you know, people that really don't know how to do science and people that don't know how to farm and people that, you know, like to go to the Chiefs games. And, I mean, they just kind of leave us with nothing. Just saying. I'm just having fun. You know that just trying to help you relate with this. That's what they did to northern Israel. They conquered them. They took the best and the brightest from them. And then they did something else. They transported people from other countries they had conquered into the land of Israel, and they mixed them together. And they did this on purpose in order to, in order to minimize the threat of the people. Think of it like this. If you really wanted to get disoriented and feel like you, weren't, you, you couldn't really function very well, have somebody drop you off in a foreign country where you don't know the landscape, you don't know the language, you don't know how anything works, but that's where you live now. Now, you don't be, you're, you're not a threat. You're just trying to figure out, how do I survive in this foreign place? It was a tactic that they used. And then what happened is, over the course of a couple hundred years, those people that were transported into Israel from other countries mixed with those that were left, the weakest, you know, and the less of society, and they began to intermarry and mix together, and they formed a group of people called what? Samaritans. Samaritans. And now there's a problem. Because fast forward a couple hundred years, 539 B.C., something happens. The then king of Assyria, Cyrus the Great, allows the conquered people of Israel, the best and the brightest, to return to Israel, to reclaim their land. You begin to see the problem? The problem is those coming back consider themselves to be the true Israelites. For 200 years, they 
They've not, they've, they've not intermixed. They've kept their bloodline clean. They've married within. But the people living in the land, the Samaritans are a mixed race. Mixes of Jew and Gentile descent to the pure blood Israelite, the Samaritans are a half breed, wannabe Jew, and that's exactly how they treated them. And that's just a small part of the hatred and a small part of the problem. And that's what makes Philip journey into Samaria so amazing because Philip understands something we all need to understand about the gospel, that the gospel isn't just for one group of people, that the gospel is for all people, that God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Philip gets that. And if you and I want to be a witness, we have to understand that that as well. That the gospel isn't just for a specific skin tone. That the gospel isn't just for people who make a certain level of income. That the gospel isn't just for people who live in a certain part of town. That the gospel isn't for people who have a certain social class. That the gospel isn't just for people who live according to our standards. See, what we have to understand is Jesus came for all people, regardless of who they are, where they came from. He loves them regardless. How do we know? How about this? Because just like Philip loved the Samaritans, Jesus did too. See, Philip wasn't the first witness to Samaria. Jesus was. Listen to what we read in the Gospel of John. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. So who's the first witness to Samaria? It's Jesus. And while we don't have time to go into the entire story of what happened in this situation, what I will tell you is he sat there and talked to this woman. He not only talked to her, he revealed to her who he was, and he offered her eternal life. But what I find most interesting about this story is that before before any of that happens, before he offers eternal life, Jesus knows exactly who she is, he knows exactly who he's talking to, and he, is, he knows exactly the mess that she's in. Listen to what we read about this woman. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you, are, you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. But Jesus has a way of getting to the point, doesn't he? Notice what he reveals about this woman. She's not only a Samaritan, but her life's an absolute train wreck. Relationally, she's, she's all over the place. She's been married five times. She's, she's, she's shacking up with a sixth guy right now. She's got issues. She's a woman with a checkered past. She has a reputation for being easy. This woman isn't the one you bring home to mom. But despite all that... Jesus talks to her. And Jesus loves her. And he offers her eternal life. See, what Jesus was doing was unheard of. In fact, when his disciples showed up, this blows their mind. Gospel of John chapter 4, just then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with the woman, but, but no one said, what, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? I mean, they're just like, what is going on? This is the twilight zone? I mean, where are we? He's talking to a Samaritan. Not only that, he's talking to a woman. This is what you need to understand about the first century. Not only did they hate Samaritans, but they didn't value women. There was no Mother's Day in the first century. Moms weren't honored. Women weren't honored. They were like cattle, commodities. Here Jesus is, talking to a Samaritan of all people and a woman. That's why the Apostle Paul says this in Galatians 4 or 3. He says, For as many of you were baptized into Christ and put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Paul says, listen, when you put your faith in Jesus, there is no race or class, there is no gender, it, all that goes out of the window. All God sees is a person that needs to be saved. And what was true for Jesus and Philip and Paul needs to be true for us. 
Here's the bottom line for us. If we want to be witnesses, if we want to be a witness for Jesus, we have to be willing to love all people, willing to look past skin color, willing to look past social demographic, willing to look past reputation, willing to look past sexual orientation, willing to look past lifestyle, willing to look past what their family name is, willing to look past what what we see in their past and see a person that God loves, a person he died for, a person that, to be honest with you, is no better than you and no less than you one of his creation. Those are the kind of witnesses Jesus is looking for. He's looking for witnesses who will take the gospel to people who need Jesus. Listen, if you want to be a witness, you have to be willing to love all people. Second, in order to be a witness, you have to be willing to lead them to Jesus. Luke writes, and Philip went down to the city of Samaria of all places, and proclaim to them the Christ. Luke says as Philip goes down to Samaritan, to the Samaritans, he leads them to Jesus. Now, you might be thinking, why is that significant? It's significant because what I want you to notice is he didn't lead them to a certain church or denomination. He didn't lead them to a specific ritual or spiritual heritage. He didn't lead them to a popular preacher or podcast. He didn't give them the best-selling Christian book on the market. He didn't say, let me tell you about the seven steps to your best life now. No, none of that. You know what he did? He led them to the only person that can do anything significant in their life. He led them to Jesus. See, that's the problem. For so many Christians, for so many churches, because instead of leading them to Jesus, we lead them to other things. We lead them to a religion. We lead them to self-help steps. We lead them to a certain church. We lead them to adopt a certain belief system. We lead them, you know, to, to, to something that we've drummed up that we think they need in their life. And I'm not saying that, I'm saying, you know, some of that's okay. Not all of that's bad. But I'm going to tell you this. If somebody needs Jesus, here's the best person to lead them to. Jesus! Because he will lead them out of religion and into relationship. He will lead them out of worldly thinking and into kingdom thinking. He will lead them out of ungodly lifestyles and into righteous living. Jesus will do what no pastor or priest or church or book or denomination or ritual has the power to do. He will set them free. Only Jesus can do that. Why would you take them to anything else but him? You have to lead them to Jesus. Listen, I'm not saying you, sh- you shouldn't invite them to church. I'm not saying you can't give them a great book to read. I'm not saying you can't say, go talk to my pastor. I'm not saying any of that. What I'm saying is, if somebody needs Jesus, the best thing you can do is lead them to him. Now, how do you do that? Well, there's a number of ways. How about this? How about you start by telling them what Jesus has done for you? Why don't you, why don't you start by telling them the hope you now have? the peace you now have. Why don't you start telling them about how he's transformed your marriage and your life and your finances and your outlook on life and your your job situation and how he's touched every part of your life and now your life is so much different because of Jesus. How about you start telling them what Jesus has done in your life? That's what witnesses do, church. We, We tell people about Jesus. We testify to what he's done in our life. That's what witnesses do. We tell people about him. But you can't stop there. Not only do you have to love all people, not only do you have to lead them to Jesus, but number three, you have to be willing to preach the word. Luke writes, and he went down to the city of Samaria and he proclaimed to them the Christ. The word for proclaim there comes from the Greek word keruso. It's the idea of publicly announcing religious truths and doctrine or principles while urging acceptance. Here's what this is saying. Once you lead them to Jesus, you have to be able to open your Bible and show them what the Bible actually says. And again, this is a major problem in the modern church today. Because unfortunately, a lot of Christians don't know how to do that. And I see two primary reasons why most Christians don't know how to do that. Number one, Christians don't know how to do that because they're not reading their Bibles. In fact, in a recent survey of Christians, the following was discovered concerning the Bible. 9% say they've read it all and more than once, 9%. 11% say they've read the entire Bible at least once in their life. 
12% say almost all of it. Not sure what that means. 15% say at least half of it. 30% say several passages and some popular stories, probably from Sunday school. 13% say only a few sentences or verses. 10% say none of it. Now let me put that in perspective for you. If Christians surveyed, only 32% have read most or the entire Bible. 68% have read half or none of it at all. Meaning that over 50% of people who claim to be Christians really have no idea what the Bible says. That's a problem. I mean, think about it. If you're going to lead somebody to Jesus and you're going to tell them they need Jesus, but you can't show them why, you can't explain to them why, all you, and all you really have is you, and that's great. You need to tell them about what God has done for you, but you need to be able to take them to God's words and say, let me show you what the Bible says. We have to be able to do that, church. That's not just my job, I hope you know. That's your job as well. Here's a second reason, and it plays into it, I think, that, that we struggle with, with giving people the word. Not only are Christians not reading the Bible, but a lot of churches aren't preaching the Bible. I know that might come as a shock to some of you, but it's true. And it's guilty of the entire church world. Catholicism and evangelicalism and Protestantism. All are guilty of this. Catholicism, Catholicism is guilty of it because all they focus on are sacraments, church tradition, and rituals. And I'm sure I'm stepping on some toes when I say that, but I'm sorry they don't focus on the Bible. Protestants and evangelicals, they do the same thing, but it's a little bit different. Instead of teaching and preaching Scripture, so many have given themselves to motivational speeches on how to meet your felt needs. So they come up with series titled things like How to Be a Better Spouse, Seven Steps to Your Best Life, How to Be Victorious, How to Have a Better Marriage, and I'm, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with wanting those things in your life. But what I might suggest to you is that maybe what we should do is start teaching people what the Bible actually says, and that if we start applying what the Bible actually says, that our lives might get better, that our marriages might get better, that we might have a better life, because we're beginning to live according to God's Word. We're looking at what it says. We're applying it to our lives. How do I know that would happen? Because the Bible says it'll happen. Listen to what Paul says about Scripture. He says, all Scripture is breathed out by God. Your Bible comes out of God's mouth. I want you to think about that. Everything that's in the Bible has come from God's mouth. He goes on to say, and it's profitable. It's useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness and how God wants you to live. The writer of Hebrews says this, for the word of God is living and active, it's alive. He says it's a two-edged sword, it pierces the division soul and the spirit of joints and of marrow and discerns the thoughts and intentions of the heart. It goes deeper than anything else can in your life. You can't hide from God's word. It's powerful. See, Philip understood this. He understood, listen, not only do I need to love him, not only do I need to tell him about Jesus, but I need to tell him what God's word says. I need to show him what God's word says. And I'm just telling you, if we'll do that, church, it will, it will produce supernatural results in people's lives. How do I know? Because it did in Samaria. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said. See, people want truth. People want to know what the Bible says. People are tired of religion. They're tired of rituals. They want something tangible in their life. So they listened. And when they heard him and they saw the signs that he did, unclean spirits came out. out and the many who had, who had been paralyzed and lame were healed. There was much joy in the city. That's what happens when you love people. You lead them to Jesus and you teach them God's word. God begins to move. I think it's contextual. In this context, people needed to be healed. People needed to be delivered from some pretty demonic stuff. It's different maybe in our context. Maybe marriages get healed. Maybe, maybe finances get healed. Maybe some things begin to happen. They're like, oh my goodness, how is this happening? It's God. You see, that's what happens when you love people, when you lead them to Jesus, and when you teach them God's word. That's what being a witness is. Now, here's what this is saying to us. Being a witness is more than just joining a church and becoming a member. I hope you know that. 
Being a witness is more than just you being here week to week. I'm glad you're here, but it's more than that. Being a witness is more, you know, than you wearing an all-in t-shirt. I'm glad you're wearing it. I appreciate it. But it's more than that. Being a witness is you and I being willing to love all people, lead them to Jesus, and teach them God's word. That's what witnesses do, and that's what our church is all about. Maybe you've never noticed it, but in the lobby, and I hope you will look this morning as you leave, you'd also see this in my office, and, and you'd see this in our boardroom. That there's some statements hung on the walls out there. Maybe you thought they were just some cool art we found online. They're not. They're custom made. They represent what we believe is a church, what we believe is important, what we're focused on. Three statements. The first one says, love all people. It says that because at MCF, regardless of your background, where you came from, who you are, what your last name is, what you did in the past, how many times you've been married, what drugs you did, none of that matters when you walk through these doors. We love you where you're at. Why? Because that's what Jesus did. He took that woman where she was at. He took you where you were. You were messed up when you came to Jesus. So no judgment when you walk through these doors. And if you feel judgment, come talk to me and show me who's judging because we don't judge here. We love all people where they're at. Now we'll say this, second statement, lead people to Jesus. We're not going to lead you there. That would be unkind. That would not be loving to leave you where we found you. We're going to lead you somewhere. We're going to lead you to a Savior. Because we believe if we lead you to Jesus, that Jesus has the trans power to transform your mess. Jesus has the power to deliver you from drug addiction. Jesus has the power to heal your marriage. Jesus has the power to do it. No Bible, or I mean no preacher, no pastor, no, no, no doctrine, no, no whatever can do. He has the power to do it all. So we're going to lead you to him. We're going to tell you about him. We're going to introduce you to him. We're going to encourage you to make him Lord and Savior of your life because we believe it will transform your life. And then we're going to do a third thing, third statement. We're going to preach the word. And it says that because at MCF, not only are we going to love you, not only are we going to lead you to Jesus, we're going to tell you what the Bible actually says. Because we believe it's more than just a good book. We believe, like Paul says, like the writer of Hebrews says, that it has power to transform us, that if we give ourselves to it, if we'll live by it, it will change us, it will transform us. We don't want you just to understand it and have knowledge of it. We want you to experience it in your life. And you can. And that's why we're committed to expository preaching. That's why week after week, we are going to take God's word. We're going to break it down. We're going to look at it. We're going to understand it. We're going to learn that the chiefs are in there somewhere from time to time. They're called Samaritans. It's what witnesses do. The question really for you this morning is, are you committed to that? I know I am. I know our church is. But are you committed to being that kind of of a witness. We close this morning. Let me give you three questions you can ask yourself that I think help determine that. First question is this. Do you love all people? Maybe another way to say that or another way to ask that question is do you love the Samaritans in your life? You realize we all have Samaritans in our life, right? You know who the Samaritans are? People who you think you're better than. That's who they are. Now you might say, Pastor, I don't think I'm better than anybody. That's not true. Every time you're critical of someone, anytime you look at somebody's life and say, glad that's not my life, you know what you're saying? Too bad they're not like me. You know, I hope someday they get better. Boy, I hope someday they wake up. That's a Samaritan. The Samaritan is the person who has the reputation that you probably don't want to associate with. See, that's the person, you know, that, that, that maybe you heard gets around. Oh, they've been married several times. Oh, they, they got a drug history. But you know what? I think they're gay. Pretty sure. That's the Samaritan. The Samaritan is the person that you probably wouldn't invite over for dinner. Rather not have them in my house. That's a Samaritan. Question is, are you willing to love that person? Because that's what witnesses do. We, we can't even begin to fathom what it meant for Philip to go to Samaritan, 
the Samaritans. That was like, that was like unbelievable. Do you have that kind of love for people? Starts there, because if you don't, you can't be a witness. Because Jesus wants to reach people like that. Here's a second question. Are you leading people to Jesus? In other words, are you telling people about their need for Jesus? Are you seeking out opportunities to share your faith? Because that's what witnesses do. On a daily basis, they tell people about Jesus. They proclaim his name to others. And if you're not doing that, why aren't you doing that? What's stopping you? What's keeping you from doing that? Are you worried people will think you're weird? Are you worried that they'll label you some kind of Jesus freak? Here's my challenge to you this morning. Listen to what Jesus says about this. He says, For whoever is ashamed of me in my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. You know what Jesus is saying there? Listen, if you're ashamed of me when I come and you're like, Jesus, Jesus, I'm going to be like, I don't know you. Who are you? You were ashamed of me. You said you followed me, but you didn't tell people about me. Let me ask you something. Are you worried about what people might say? Do you have more of a fear of man or God? Are you worried more about what your coworkers will think, your friends will think, your family members will think, or are you more concerned about what God will think? Because that's really the two, that's, those are the two that you have to decide on. Am I going to fear man or am I going to fear God? Are you sharing your faith? Are you telling others about Jesus? Third question. Are you not only telling, are you teaching? Are you sharing what you know the Bible says about Jesus? And if you're not able to do that, are you willing to learn? Listen, I understand the Bible. It's a big book. I get it. It's complicated. I understand. It can be a little overwhelming. It can be a little intimidating when you pick it up and you begin to read. I, I get all that. But I'm just telling you, if you want to be a witness, you have to learn what the Bible says. Now here's, here's just a, four suggestions for you this morning in doing that. Number one, start reading it. You know, I, I'm tired of people telling me, Pastor, I don't read it because I don't understand it. That's dumb. That, that's like if I'm a teacher and you're, you don't know math yet and I hand you a math book and you're like, I'm not going to read that, I don't understand it. Well, I get that, but how are you going to learn math? By reading it, by studying what's in it, right? So you got to pick it up. you got to start reading it. Number two, you need to get a good study Bible. I would suggest an NIV study Bible. Write that down, NIV study Bible. Amazon.com, you can have it in a couple days. It's a great Bible. It has everything you need, all the tools you need to better understand God's Word. It has commentary written in. It, it explains things. It teaches you how to read the Bible. It gives you a history of each book. I mean, honestly, church, we have no excuse not to read our Bibles. The Bible for dummies is out there, all right? And we're dummies. Number three, be in church every Sunday because every week, guess what we're going to do? We're going to study God's Word. We're going to, week by week, jump into the passage of Scripture, uncover what's there, apply it to our lives. If you're new to our church, we've done that with several books of the Bible, Galatians, Philippians, Mark. We've done it with uh, Romans. We've done it with Judges. We're doing it with Acts right now. So grab your Bible, go online, listen, follow along, study God's Word. Fourth, and I think maybe even most important, as you read the Bible, ask God to open your eyes, your ears, and your heart to it. Remember, it's alive. It's His Word. So if you go to the Bible and you struggle with understanding it, and you say to your Heavenly Father, God, I want to learn what you're saying to me, what do you think God's going to do? Do you think He's going to be say, oh, well, tough luck, go learn Greek? Go, go learn some Hebrew. Maybe I'll talk to you. No. He's going to supernaturally open up his word to you. But you've got to be willing to read it. That's where it starts. Here's the deal, church. If you want to be a witness, number one, you've got to love all people. Right where they're at. And that's hard to do in our culture, isn't it? Number two, you've got to tell them about Jesus. Why would you tell them about anything else? 
guests, invite them to church, have them listen to a podcast, give them a book. But by me, by all means, tell them about Jesus. He's the only one that can transform their life. Number three, tell them what the Bible says. And to do that, you're going to have to do some study. Because that's what witnesses do. Amen? Would you bow your heads with me? Holy Father, we thank you for your word today. And Lord, as always, it challenges us. Lord, it causes us to step back and reflect on our faith. And Lord, what we're learning this morning is that following you isn't just about escaping hell. That's part of it. But the other part is about becoming a witness. It's about telling others now about their need for you. And Lord, if we're honest this morning, that's hard sometimes. There's a lot of things that keep us from doing that at times. But Lord, I pray that you would help us to push past all those things and to be obedient this morning. Lord, to be willing to love all people, even if they're not like us, even if they are different than us. Lord, to see what you see, somebody that needs to be saved. Lord, that you would help us to lead them to you. Lord, that we not be ashamed or fearful of what someone might think, but Lord, that we would stand firm and tell them about you. And Lord, that we would be able to teach them your word. Lord, that you would open our minds and our hearts to your word to better understand, to be able to explain to others their need for you. We ask that you do this this morning. We ask, Lord, that we would be your witnesses. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with us? Thank you.